class. Um, and this is the same for the tutorials, because in the tutorials, again, you're supposed to be engaging with the materials, not with your phone. And so I ask you to put them away when you're in tutorials as well as in lecture. Okay, so um, what we are about here, I've got a tail here. Um, what we're talking about here, uh, with, it's an introduction to English, but just you all supposedly speak English. And so it's no point in me teaching you English. We're not about teaching you English. What we're about here is teaching you how to analyze English, how to be able to um, take apart, uh, say, an English text. Uh, you know, if, you, if you're reading something or writing something, the idea is to uh, understand an English text any, or any stretch of language. When I say text, it, it could be just one word. It could be um, a whole string of words. It could be a, a written document. It could be a spoken you know, bit of speech. When we say text, we just mean any bit of language. And so the idea is for you to be able to uh, take apart uh, that and see the constituent parts of it, you know, just as we would with any other thing that we were trying to analyze. So we want to take apart the constituents and then see how they relate to each other, how they help to, to create the meaning that the text is. And so the goal of this is to teach you the structure of English such a, in such a way that you will understand why it is the way it is. Uh, why the structure of the text, why the, the language works the way it works, why speakers use the structures that they use, and how you can best effectively use them. I mean, this is not about teaching you English, but one of the byproducts of learning what I'm going to be teaching in this class is that you will actually be able to evaluate texts and see why they work or don't work. Because sometimes you read something and it's like really not working. Other times you read something and it seems to flow so beautifully. That's not an accident. There are principles for uh, writing well and um, being able to express your meaning in a clear way. And so hopefully you will learn what those are in, in this class. And so we're going to be looking at the understanding of English texts or any stretch of language, uh, why the text means what it is and how it means what it, what it does. Um, and then the other thing is the evaluation of the effectiveness of the text. Uh, so you can, this is the only Theory. I'm going to be teaching you actually a particular theory called, called uh, systemic functional grammar or just functional grammar. And it's the only theory among all of the grammatical theories that actually allows you to evaluate the text to see how effective the text is in communicating the meaning. So that's why I'm teaching this uh, particular theory. I mean, there are lots of different theories I could have chosen, but this is the only one that has that evaluative component. And it's also the most comprehensive one in taking the entire um, communicative situation into account, whereas all the others kind of extract away from the, the communicative situation and just look at language in isolation. And that really doesn't help, help you a lot. It just looks at this, the forms by themselves as if they exist in some parallel universe, but they don't. They actually are always used in, an, in a real context. And so this is the only theory or no, one of the few theories that actually makes a, a point of looking at the language in the particular context in which it's used because the meaning is different depending on how you use it. So this is why I'm, I'm using this, this theory. Um, and as I say here, the first step, the analysis of the grammar is already a work of interpretation. So there's nothing objective about doing analysis. It's all interpretation. So when you're an, analyzing a text, there's an, a, an interpretive component, you know, there's some subjectivity involved there. Even just understanding what a text means is, is, um, it, uh, involves interpretation. Um, and so the, the description of the language and the analysis of the text are both part of this interpretive task. Now, the theory I'm going to be talking about is systemic functional linguistics. And it was created um, originally not based on English, but based on Chinese. Uh, this was Michael Halliday back in the 1940s was studying Chinese linguistics in China with Wang Li and, and Luo, Luo Changpei, two of the top linguists in China at the time. Um, he had to leave China, though, because of the uh, revolution in 1949. And then 1950, he had to leave China and go back to England. But he had started to develop this theory as a way of understanding a Chinese text called The Secret History of the Mongols, but then later developed the theory uh, in looking at English texts as well, and then wrote this textbook uh, introduction of Functional Grammar, which he first wrote in the 1980s, but then this is the second edition, is the one we're going to be using, 
There's also a third and a fourth edition, but I don't want to use those because they're like this big and they're full of stuff that I don't think is that necessary. So this book is called Introduction to Functional Grammar. There's a systemic part of the theory which involves making it very complicated that he purposely left out in the second edition, but that was all put back in the third edition and fourth edition. So that's why I'm not using those two. Um, but anyway, Michael is still alive. He's 92 years old and he's still one of the greatest linguists that ever lived and really nice guy too. Um, he lives in Sydney, uh, although he's from England originally and um, has a, had a very interesting life and um, uh, has been very influential. So this theory, if you had any linguistics at all in, uh, in the JCs, uh, some of the JCs teach linguistics, some don't, but if you had any linguistics that you would have studied Halliday and linguistics. Um, all, he has been the most influential linguist in terms of particularly language teaching, um, translation, any kind of applied stuff because his theory, while it's a very full on theoretical approach, just like any other theory, it's actually useful. Most syntactic theories actually aren't very useful. His is very useful for things like language teaching, for translation, for editors, for anybody who wants to get more meaning out of language and be able to write better, be able to understand what's going on in text. So this is why it's been very influential uh, all around the world. And so that's another reason why I want to teach this theory is because if you go out of here and you get a job either in schools uh, or in translation or in whatever field you go into, you will almost definitely run into this theory. Um, and so if you know something about it, it will help you. Now, um, the most basic concept that's involved here in this theory, or in almost any theory, is constituency and function. And constituency and function just means taking something apart and seeing what the constituent parts are. In other words, the parts that go together to make it up. And then seeing how they relate to each other, what kind of systems they form. So we call this constituency and function, you know, what function they have. And um, so if we look at a car, car engine, I don't know if this is going to work. Uh, if you look at a car engine, there are different uh, systems. We don't talk about the car engine just as a single thing. We break it down into the cooling system, the power train system. Okay, so if we have it, we have different parts going on um, in the system. And so there's, this is a piston, uh, it's crushing the, 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 the air and uh, fuel together and then it explodes and causes heat and power. Uh, some of that heat is um, exhausted through the gas, the, the exhaust pipe. Some of it is absorbed by the engine block. So there has to be a way of cooling down the engine block. And so the engine block is cooled by the, um, the coolant that runs through the engine block. And then that coolant, this is kind of slow. Uh, so the coolant then runs through here and through this radiator and is cooled by this fan. And the fan is turned, whoops, go back a little bit. I'll just stop here. The, um, so my, the thing is the water then goes through this radiator, uh, and which is a bunch of like thin film uh, where the water can trickle down very slowly uh, and then be subjected to the wind from this fan. And the fan is turned by this belt and the belt is connected to the crankshaft and the crankshaft is connected to these pistons. So the pistons, this is not the best video for this, but the pistons go up and down. You can see over here, there's a, there's a shaft that goes through here that the pistons turn. This is called the crankshaft, which you can't see now because of the thing there. Um, I should have gotten a better video. I actually have another video, but um, uh, to, the point, hopefully you get the point that um, there are, the crankshaft is actually part of the powertrain. 
So it's the part of the engine that, that transfers the power from the pistons, the things that are going up and down, like this in terms of what the nice music, uh, that go up and down, and then that turns the crankshaft, and the crankshaft sends that power to the wheels. Um, now, at the same time, the crankshaft is turning that uh, belt that turns the fan, which then cools the water in the radiator, and so then that water then circulates through the engine block. So you can see how we can talk about the circulatory system of the engine or the cooling system of the engine. So it's circulating the water and it's got these things. And then we can also talk about the powertrain. We can also talk about different other aspects of the, uh, of the engine and then see how not only how they, what they're doing in there, the different parts of those individual systems interact, but how the same part like the, like the crankshaft is involved in two different systems at the same time. This is a key principle that we're going to be talking about in linguistics as well. And, um, oops, wait, I'm still stuck in here, wait. Uh, so, um, with, um, I'm not going to read all of this stuff, but the, uh, uh, so I've got another one. Uh, so the same principle works in anatomy. So when we talk about the human body, the idea is that you have individual systems. We, we're all one big organism, but within that big organism, we have lots of subsystems that we talk about. So we talk about the lymph system, we talk about the circulatory system, we talk about the, um, uh, uh, the, the, um, the breathing, breathing system, we, there's another name, a pulmonary system. Um, there's all these different kinds of systems that we can talk about and very often the same things are involved. So like the heart is involved in respiration, respiratory system. That's the word I was looking for. I, I'm an old man. I forget things easily. Um, so there's a respiratory system. So the heart is involved in the respiratory system and it's also involved in the uh, circulatory system. So it's the same principle that we, you can take any complex phenomenon, break it down into its com component parts see how those components relate to each other, but also see how those are what we call the functional structures, you know, the, those things. But then the reality of the, the physical element itself, in this case, say the heart or the crankshaft, that can be involved in different systems at the same time. So the systems are our way of making sense of what's going on within the organism. And there are multiple ways of, of breaking that up. It's not that there's only one way of doing it. In the history of of um, human anatomy. I mean, we've had many different ways of understanding the human body. So that changes all the time as our understanding of uh, the, the systems and how they work. Or sometimes we come up with very different systems. So until we started doing dissection, we thought the heart was a furnace. And the reason why the, red was, the blood was red is because it's cooked by the furnace and, and so it becomes red like anything you burn. Um, and they were, you know, it was a full theory of, of how anatomy worked. Um, but now we don't quite think that way. So uh, you can see here, this is a book uh, introducing the human body and it says an introduction to structure and function. That's the subtitle of the book. So the principle is exactly the same. Regardless of what you study, you, the principle is basically the same. You look at the structures, you look at their functions, how they interrelate, how the different functional structures interrelate. And so what I'm going to be teaching you is basically the same thing applied to language. Um, so the same is true in linguistics. Uh, we use part of the terminology and analysis from anatomy when we're talking about the biology of speech. So for something like the, the, um, the larynx, right? Uh, you haven't studied phonetics yet, but when you get into phonetics, you'll learn all about the, the, the structures here, the physical structures. Uh, the larynx and um, the hyoid bone and all these other things that are going on in here and how we use them in speech. None of it developed for speech. It developed for swallowing and other functions, but we use it for speech. And so we can talk about it from the point of view of speech. We can talk about it from the point of view of swallowing. And in fact, if you do uh, speech pathology, like say, in, you know, most speech pathology departments, they actually spend a lot of time talking about swallowing, not so much about speech. Um, because it's really all the same mechanism. They're, 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 all these mechanisms develop for swallowing. And uh, so like you have the epiglottis, which is to prevent you from choking when you swallow. But we also use it, we have actually one of the world's top experts on the epiglottis who will probably be teaching 
phonetics last, uh, next semester. So you'll get to learn a lot about that. Um, so, the, but the same thing, the same principle that we need to break it down into different levels and constituents and give them names. So just like we, you know, in the car, we have to talk about the radiator and the pistons and the crankshaft, we have to give them names. Or in the anatomy, you have to talk about the heart or the lungs or whatever, you have to give them names. We do the same thing in, um, in linguistics. So you have to break it down into constituents, give them names, uh, say what they do, uh, and give the functions names. Now, in language, there's a number of different ways. Uh, hopefully, you might have read the, uh, the reading, so you would have, this would be uh, just a review. But in case you didn't, uh, the idea is that we can break language down from a phonetics point of view, from a graphic point of view, uh, from a number of different ways we can break it down. And so in, the case, in this case, if we have phonetics or phonology where we're breaking the, the, the system down, um, we can do it from uh, like the, phone, the, the different levels of sound. So the smallest is uh, at least significant in language is what we call the phoneme, then it goes to the foot, then the syllable, I mean the syllable, then the foot, then the tone group. In writing, we can, we can do it. So like here, I've given, just taking this thing, a graphic constituency. If we have a written, two written sentences like this, we can break five men into the room, then they left into subparts. So each of these words can be considered a subpart. And then these two sentences, this is one utterance, you might say. So then we can break this down uh, into two sentences and then a number of different words, and then the words into different letters. So this is basically just looking at the constituents that make up this graphic enemy. So when I say graphic, it means it's written. Uh, we're, we're not mainly looking at graphic, but this is an easy way to, to look at things. Um, if we're looking at phonetic constituency, then what we've got is uh, breaking it down into the individual sounds. So the sound is a, we call a phone, uh, so, like, if you have, um, uh, this is a phonetic uh, representation, um, and if we do that, then we can break it down into these individual sounds or phones, and then we can see that there are groups of these things, like this is said together, so that forms a constituent. Uh, this is a phonetic, so we can break that down into these syllables, and then the, the syllables form foot, uh, at least in English, we have a certain rhythm of the way we speak, which is often uh, light, heavy, light, heavy, and those form what we call metric feet. Um, so um, these, these can, can in many cases be grouped as uh, different feet. And then those all together, since this is said as one utterance, can be seen as a tone group or one, um, it's kind of one breath. You say it all together as one breath. So that's what a tone group basically is. So the principle is just basically looking at the constituents, whatever it is you're working with, whether it's a graphic or a phonetic, um, and breaking it down into the constituent parts. Now we're going to be looking mainly at grammar. Uh, so we're going to be interested in the, um, the component parts that form uh, Mor uh, morphemes, which are the kind of basic meaning, uh, basic elements of meaning, but more so than that, we're going to be focusing on words, how words form together into groups of words uh, or phrases, uh, and then how those phrases work together to form clauses, how those clauses form together to form complex sentences. So we'll be breaking it down into those levels uh, from a point of view of grammar, and then we'll um, be looking at it from different perspectives. So it's not that there's only one way to look at something. As we saw, like with the crankshaft, you can look at it from the point of view of the cooling system, or you can look at it from the point of view of the uh, powertrain. Uh, and so we're going to be doing the same thing when we have a, an expression uh, or some, some text or utterance, then we're going to be able to look at it from different perspectives. And I'll talk in a, in a minute about what those, those perspectives are. But the first thing is, when you do your breaking down into constituencies, there's different ways uh, that you can do it. You can do it in terms of maximal constituents. In other words, breaking down whatever it is you're looking at into the tiniest 
bits you can you can do. Um, and so, like in this one, I, I bought five new blue chairs. If we were to break this down in, in, into the, the minimal, uh, um, like what we call immediate constituent analysis, where there's always just two branches for every um, node on the tree. So then you would have blue chairs and then new blue chairs and then five new blue chairs and bought five new blue chairs and then I bought five new blue chairs. Now some grammatical theories work this way. Um, they will analyze the grammar from this point of view of minimal, uh, um, maximal uh, differentiation, what we call immediate constituent, because um, these, these two are the immediate constituents of a higher node like that. So um, this is one way of doing it. So this one, the, you bracket according to the order in which the elements were put together. So like I just read, you know, blue chairs, then new blue chairs, five new blue chairs, bought five new blue chairs, I bought five new blue chairs, but it has, this doesn't say anything about the function of the elements in those structures, right? So um, you put a bracket wherever you can, and it says nothing about the function of the elements, and it doesn't even impl imply that there is any uh, function. Um, it attempts to explain much of the grammar, though, in terms of this structure. Now, the opposite of this is minimal bracketing, where you only put a bracket where you kind of have to from a functional point of view. So um, this is called in this theory, the rank constituent analysis, where you're bracketing according to the functions. So if we're looking at the clause level, it, it depends on the level. So whatever level you're looking at, you would have different constituent analysis. So in this level, if we're looking at the clause as, as the level that we're interested in, then there's really only three constituents that are relevant. There's I bought something, right? So that's the three constituents that are relevant at the clause level. Um, and so uh, we don't break this down into the, this, the kind of, um, like here we broke this down into a number of different sub parts, whereas in the minimal one, we just see this as one chunk, one group, we call it. Because at the clause level, it's functioning as one group. It's, it's a one unit. It, there's nothing at the clause level there's no, the, the individual bits here have no meaning by themselves. They only function together as one unit in the clause. Now, um, so you, you put a bracket only where you have to, putting together the constituents um, that actually work as structural units within that particular item you're talking about. So in this case, the clause. So we only have the three. Um, so the explanation in this type of structure is, uh, in this type of analysis, is not so much based on the structure as based on the function. So if we were to take apart something um, into its components, like in English, when we look at text, we're going to want to break the text down into its subcomponents. And so the components we will be talking about are clause complex, which is one or more clauses that are put together into a complex sentence. Then you have clauses, which are the individual units, like he went to the store, that's one clause, or the one I just gave, this is one clause, I bought five new chairs. Um, and then you have groups and phrases, which uh, consist of one or more words that make up a unit within the clause. So the idea is that they, they do form a unit. Uh, and then you have words, which are one or more morphemes that go together to create the groups or phrases. And then you have morphemes, which is the minimum unit of meaning in language. Uh, so um, if we take a clause complex, like when the national economy is growing fast, many economic ana analysts will claim that interest rates should rise to prevent a situation of boom and bust. So that's a very complex, that's actually just one sentence but it's made up of a number of different constituents. Uh, so if we take apart the clauses, first we look at from going from the kind of larger units down to the smaller units, we can see that there are four clauses within this clause complex, this, this uh, complex sentence. So we have when the national economy is growing fast, many economic analysts will claim that the interest rate should rise to prevent a situation of boom and bust. So that's our first cut in terms of breaking this down into the constituent parts. 
The second one, we can break down the, those clauses into individual groups and phrases. So the national economy is one, one group, is growing is another group, fast, although it's only one word, it's still considered kind of a group there because it functions um, at the clause level as, a, as one unit. Uh, many economic analysts is one unit, so that's a group there. Will claim is a group, interest rates is a group, should rise is a group, and all the others. And then we can take those groups and phrases and look at the individual words that form the constituents of those groups and phrases. So we have national, we have the, we have growing, we have economic, we have claim, we have rates, analysts, and many, many, this is a very incomplete list because there's so many of them. And then we can look at the constituent parts of the words and the words are made up, some of them only have one morpheme, some of them have more than one. So like national, has two, this nation and al are two different morphemes. Um, economic has econ or econom, which we usually don't use by itself, but the, we see the ik as a separate uh, morpheme. And then growing, grow is a separate morpheme from ing. Analysts, we have analyst versus s as two different morphemes. So we've taken this big chunk of um, this whole big claw, uh, multiple clause, uh, complex structure and broken it down into different levels, uh, the clause level, then the group level, then the word level, and then the morpheme level. And so this is how we do grammatical analysis, by breaking these things down and then seeing how they relate to each other. Once we do break them down, how do they relate to each other? What are they doing there? Is It's not just a random throwing together a bunch of morphemes or, or words or, or phrases or clauses, there is a reason for putting them together in the way that we put them. And so that's what we're going to be exploring in this, this course is why are they like that? Um, you know, how can we understand uh, what the author, you know, or whoever the speaker is in trying to, in saying what they said, how can we best understand what they intended? Um, now, what, so after breaking it down, the thing we have to do is give the elements uh, names, we have to label them, right? So just like with the engine parts, we take apart the engine, we have to label this as the crankshaft and this is the radiator and this is the piston. The same thing with these, uh, when we break these things down, we have to give them some kind of label. Now, some of the grammatical theories will give the labeling based on uh, the grammatical or the, what we call the word class or form class so like noun and verb or adjective, and they will give those kind of labels. Uh, so that's one way of labeling things. And uh, that's kind of like the dictionary information that you, you know, the, the kind of information you find about a word in a dictionary. The problem with that is that it doesn't actually tell you what the word is doing in a particular context. So if you say like Alice Springs is a town in the country, Alice Springs is a, is a noun there, town is a noun, uh, country is a noun, but when you say Alice Springs is a country town, then country is not working as really kind of noun there. It's more like an adjectival type of meaning, a modificational meaning. It's not referring to a place. Or I own a townhouse in Alice Springs. If you say I own a townhouse, then it's town is not referring to a place there. It's talking about a kind of house. Um, or if you say, I'm getting the real Alice Springs experience, then Alice Springs there is no longer a place. It's a, it's a, a modificational, it has a modificational sense there. In other words, it's functioning to tell you what type of experience it is. Um, so these are, we can use the same words in many different ways. And so just saying that this is a noun or this is a verb doesn't really tell you what it's actually doing in any particular instance of that. And so it doesn't help you that much in, in understanding these texts. Uh, what you need to do is to be able to understand what it's, what's doing in that particular text. And so this is where we use for functional labeling. Um, and so you would look at what is the, the element doing, like the, when I was reading those um, uh, examples just now, when I said, oh, this has a modificational uh, function, or it has a a referential function means it refers to that town or it refers to that thing. Um, so that's referential function or it has some. So there are different ways that we will be talking about um, what the thing is doing there. 
And so normally maximal bracketing is associated with form class labeling and minimal bracketing is associated with functional labeling. We're going to be doing minimal bracketing and functional labeling because what we're really interested at in, in is meaning. And meaning is really based on this function. So meaning doesn't exist in words. I know that's going to sound weird. There's no word, there's no meaning in words by themselves. Um, meaning comes from use. Uh, it comes, language is not a thing, it's a behavior. And we interpret what people are intending for us to understand. We create meaning when somebody interacts with us uh, based on our own experiences and based on what they've done to make us try to guess their meaning. And it may involve language, it may not involve language, uh, but the point is that the, the meaning isn't in the words themselves. If you just say a word by itself, like table or desk, that doesn't really have a meaning itself. You have to see in a particular context how, that, how the person is using the word, and then you will create a meaning based on your inference of what the person intends for you to understand from that use. So meaning comes from use. And so use is function. And so that's why we're going to be looking at function because we want to get to meaning. And function is use. Use is what gives us the meaning. And so that's why we have to look at function um, rather than just looking at form in some abstract sense. Um, when we speak of structure, we mean any viable uh, configuration of functions. So the structures we're going to be talking about are not um, necessarily the physical structures. They're what we call functional structures. So they're um, combinations of different types of, of functions that go together uh, and help us to understand what's going on in the text. So the, the functions are interpretable only in relation to other functions in the same structure. So the, well, I'll give you examples of what I mean about, by this in a minute. But the, the structures are made up. So we're going to be talking, the first one we're going to be talking about next week is called theme and ream. So there's one function called theme and there's another one called ream. Um, in English, that kind of works out to kind of topic and comment. And so I'll just briefly, we'll, we'll call it that. But the idea is that topic is only topic in relation to the comment, and the comment is only a comment in relation to the topic. So the functional structure of topic and comment, or theme and ream, only makes sense when the two parts are together, right? So they, it's the functional structure of this do having that function and this having that function. When you put the two together, that creates a functional structure, which then gives you some kind of meaning. So this is the kind of thing we're going to be looking at in this class. And as, as we saw with the, um, the human body and with the uh, car engine, the, uh, where the individual bits are multifunctional, like the heart uh, working in both the circulatory system and the respiratory system and the crankshaft operating in both the cooling system and the uh, drive chain, the linguistic items are also multifunctional. So a constituent in one particular con functional structure will also be a constituent in a different um, functional structure. So they will have more than one function at the same time. And so that's why we'll be looking, we'll be teasing apart the different functions of the same elements at the same time. We'll do a little bit of that towards the end of today. Um, it's still one clause though. So it's really just different perspectives. So it's like I put that there and I can look at it from this way or I can look at it from that way, uh, but it's still the same thing. It hasn't moved, it hasn't done anything, right? So we're going to be doing that. So we're going to be looking at a sentence from different, even though the sentence is not really a thing, we're going to be looking at it from different perspectives to see if we can get the best understanding of why somebody would say it the way they said it. So those different ways of looking at it, they, you know, just like, you know, different perspectives, we call three dimensions of, or types of meaning or meta functions of the structure. Um, so the first one that we're going to talk about is the clause as a message. So very simply, uh, when you say something, because speech is linear and writing is also linear, you have to put the words in a particular order, right? That seems common sense. Very few theories have really dealt with that issue, but there is a necessary order um, because you're, you, you can only say one word after the other or write one word after the other. Um, you, there is a certain linearity, and so the textual metafunction is looking at this linearity. Why does the speaker pick 
to, why does it choose to say one word before the other? You know, if I say, yesterday I went to the store, or I could say, I went to the store yesterday, why is there a difference? Why, why would I put yesterday first as opposed to yesterday at the end, right? We want to look at that type of thing. We want to find out why. Why, why would that be? What, what's the difference? How does that change our creation of meaning? How does it change how we understand what the person said, right? So we're going to be looking at that aspect. Um, it's, you know, to some extent topic comment, but it's much more complicated than that. The second aspect of meaning that we're going to be looking at is the clause as exchange. And this is, again, something that most grammatical theories don't deal with, but it's really important. In other words, if I'm talking to you, we're having a conversation, I'm not just telling you something, I'm doing something with you, right? I'm giving you information or I'm asking for information or I'm giving you something, or I'm asking for something. So there's an interaction going on. And this is actually reflected in the structure in what we call mood, the mood of the clause, when we have imperative mood, like when I order you, sit down. Or if I ask you a question, you have an interrogative mood. Could you please, uh, no, like if I say, can you give me that, or something like that. So that would be an interrogative mood. So that's, there's actually a grammatical manifestation of what's going on between the speaker and the hearer. But there are other aspects to it. So like, say for example, if I say, hopefully you're all understanding what I'm saying. It's that hopefully, when I was young, people would say, oh, that's ungrammatical. You shouldn't say hopefully you're understanding what I'm saying because the hopefully has nothing to do with understanding. So, because hopefully has the form of an adverb and an adverb is supposed to be modifying the verb. Uh, and the verb is understanding. And, but in this case, it's actually not modifying understanding at all. Why is it there? Anybody? Why do we say, hopefully, you're understanding what I'm saying? What am I expressing by saying that? Yeah, my own opinion, exactly. And my opinion about, or my feelings about it, you know, um, so there is this kind of real world statement, I, you, are, you are understanding what I'm saying, or I hope you're understanding what you're saying. But the hopefully, the hopefully is like saying, I hope you, are, you understand. So hopefully there is not expressing the kind of real world knowledge about you understanding. It has nothing to do with that. It's expressing my subjective take on it, my subjective opinion, my, uh, my feelings about it, that I, I am hopeful that you will uh, do this. And we, we have a lot of these expressions. So it can be in terms of something like hopeful, or I could say, frankly, I would really, you know, when you say frankly, it just means I'm being frank, or I'm being honest with you, right? It has nothing to do with what you say after that in terms of the actual real world meaning of what you say after that. But you're just giving your subjective, you know, your personal take on it. You also, when you're not so sure uh, about something, you would say, maybe, you know, he's going to do this. So if you say, maybe he's going to do this, then you're saying, well, he might do it, he might not do it. It's not, he will do it, which is yes. He won't do it, which is no. It's somewhere in between there. So we have a lot of these words like he must do it, he might do it, he's, you know, that go in between the yes and no. And so those are expressing our, our personal meaning. So we call this the interpersonal meaning of the clause. So it's what's going on between the speaker and the hearer, both in terms of what kind of interaction is happening, but also these uh, subjective personal things. And it includes um, even things like swear words. So if I say, you know, that damn, computer broke down again. So then that damn, that also has a personal function. It has nothing to do with the computer breaking down and the computer doesn't care about it. Um, but it's just letting you know that I'm annoyed that the computer broke down, right? So that's this interpersonal function. Uh, it's not ungrammatical or anything. It just has a different function from the other, the rest of the clause. So that's the second part of the meaning we're going to be looking at. And the third part of the meaning is what I've been calling so far the real world meaning which is the, the, we call it the ideational or experiential meaning. It's what you ex actually experience in, in the real world. So if I, um, if I you know, drop this and I say, the, or I put this on here and I say the pointer is on the table, so the real world expression of the pointer is on the table, that's the ideational meaning. It's kind of the message, the real world message that I'm trying to get across. But in order to get this message across, I will often add elements of this interpersonal meaning, and also I have to put it together in some kind of linear order, so then we have the, te the, the textual meaning or the, the meaning, the clause's message. 
So all of these things together, um, I can, it's the same uh, uh, sentence. We only have, or clause, so I'm going to be using clause here. Uh, it's the same utterance, the same clause, but we can look at it from these three different perspectives. So if we look at something like the queen bought the king a dog, um, there is a, um, an experiential, let's start with the experiential meaning, where somebody bought somebody something, right? So that's the real world meaning of it. And in this case, the somebody who did it, we call the actor, the one who did the actual buying in this case. Uh, so the queen bought the king a dog. So the, the queen is the one who bought the dog, um, the king is the one it was given to, and the dog is the thing that was given. So we're gonna have labels for all of these things within that experiential sense. Uh, but for, for today, I'm just gonna talk about this, one of the key uh, elements. Um, and as I mentioned, this, like calling this the actor only really makes sense in the context of having other participants or, or at least the process, the verb, uh, so it, within that exp experience or structure. So it's, I'm kind of violating my own way of talking here by, by isolating these. But just to show you how the same element, in this case the queen, can have different um, functions uh, depending on, on which way we look at it. So from the interpersonal point of view, we call this queen the, the subject. From the textual point of view, it's the theme. So it, uh, by here, we can simply just say theme means topic. Subject means it, it's, a grammatic, it's a kind of grammatical relationship. It's kind of the one that has the responsibility for the truth of the statement. In this case, uh, uh, it, it's, it's very different uh, between, say, English and Chinese. If you speak Chinese, Chinese is simply topic comment. It doesn't have subject and predicate. So it, it may be a difficult concept to understand. But there's a special relationship between the subject and the predicate in English. It's a grammaticalized relationship that doesn't exist in all languages. But in English, we have it. And so we're using this as one function, this grammatical marking of uh, one, one element um, as having this special relationship to the rest of the clause. And uh, we'll get more into that as we go on. But just for today, just assume subject and then theme and actor. But we can. In, in another context, the person may, not, may say the same experiential meaning in a different way. So the same experiential meaning, you could say, the king was bought a dog by the queen. So we have different ways of expressing the same ideational meaning. The ideational meaning is, is the real world meaning. So changing the words around doesn't change the ideational meaning. It doesn't change the real world meaning. So if I put this on the table or I say, this thing was put on the table, the reality of this thing being put on the table has not changed. It's just how I talk about it has changed. So we have this flexibility um, uh, in terms of choosing how we talk about things. And so in this case, instead of saying the queen bought the king of dog, I could say in the same exact situation, I could say the king was bought a dog by the queen. Now, there may be a number of different reasons why I would say it this way. You know, if I want to say that the king is kind of more important to this issue than the queen is, so I make him the topic, I make him the theme. Uh, and in this case, grammatically, because this is a passive, even though he's not the actor, he is normally the actor in a, an active sentence, the actor and the subject are the same. But in a passive sentence, a non-actor becomes the subject and then the actor is still there, but ends up in a different phrase uh, with the by, the, the preposition by. Or we could say that dog, the king, the queen bought for the king, where the dog here is just put in the initial position as a topic, or in this we call it theme. Uh, the queen is, is here the subject, uh, and the queen is still the actor. So this isn't even the, all of the possibilities. There are other possibilities for moving these things around. Um, and so uh, what we will be doing is, by looking at the interplay of these different aspects of meaning, these different what we call metafunctions, then you can see how people can manipulate the meaning of what they're saying, right? So if we take the ideational metafunction as kind of what the person mainly is trying to get across, the real world meaning, then you can see that there are possibilities for doing it in different ways. And those carry meaning as well. So they will change how the person understands it. Um, 
Now, this may seem very uh, abstract right now, but it will become very real as we do. Uh, we're going to be doing, that's one thing I should tell you about the course, is we're going to be doing real hands-on analysis of natural texts. And so everything will be the same, the tutorials, the tests, the, every, the homework, everything that you do will be the same, analyzing text. There'll be no surprises. Um, and so it will just get you used to constantly working with texts and analyzing them. So you'll get really good at it um, and understand why the texts are they are. So this is just a, a, a very small beginning. Um, um, and we call this functional grammar, and I should talk about why, um, before I get onto this, let me ask um, if anybody has any questions. I shouldn't say anybody, I said, who has questions? Because any, any is a loaded word. You know, there, there are very subtle things in language. If I ask you, uh, do you have some questions? Or I ask you, do you have any questions? Actually, that influences how you will respond. If I say, do you have any questions, you are more likely to say no. If I say, do you have some questions, you're more likely to say yes. This is how great language is. It's very subtle. This has been shown you know, uh, with a lot of psycholinguistic tests that there is a real difference between when you select words and you select structures, they, they influence the meaning and the kind of reaction you'll get from the other people. So, do you have some questions? Don't be afraid to ask questions, because like I said, this is meant to be a conversation. It shouldn't just be, this is why I don't want you to just read the, watch the lectures online or something like that. The university wants to do this flipped classroom stuff, but the, they don't understand the lecture isn't just a performance where I just go online and, and, and perform like a monkey. This is a conversation between you and me. And so I, hopefully you will not turn it into a monologue. Anyone? Okay, think about it. We'll take a break and then we'll think about it. We'll come back in 10 minutes. Are there any uh, copies of the handouts left? I have, I have two piles, one on each side for people when they came in. But are there any extras? I made 88 copies and there's only 85 of you, so there should be some left.
Okay. <coughs> hello, hello, hello. Let's get back into it. Uh, it's been 10 minutes. There are a number of questions. Uh, a lot of people, hello, hello, hello. A lot of people had questions about the concept of subject. Don't, don't worry about it for now. We're just using this as an example of the multifunctionality of the individual words um, in different structures. So, don't worry about the exact definition. We will talk about that in week three. So next week we'll talk about the theme, Areem, the textual metafunction. And then in week four we'll talk about the subject and other parts of the interpersonal uh, metafunction. So for now, all I just want you to get is um, the, the idea that uh, the same word, like queen, ca can appear in different um, metafunctions with different structures, I mean different uh, functions, and that can be manipulated so that the same element can, uh, depending on how, how these, the words are put together, um, then you will, will have different functions. And so we, we need to look at that. Now, w this theory is, a, um, actually before I get started, I, I, I took this out so we can talk about it. I didn't, I gave you the course outline. It's also online. Um, there's actually a typo on here that it says the lecture is till 3.30, we're not, I'm not gonna do that, uh, it's till 2.30, uh, because we also have the tutorials from 2.30 to 3.30. Um, that was just a mistake, because normally I teach seminars and they're always three hours, so I just kind of automatically thought it was three hours and then realized that it's, uh, this is done differently. Um, so the, uh, there's also been a change in the tutorial rooms. I printed this out early and then we later uh, decided that it would be better to have a consistent Amanda in one room and uh, Luke in another room. Uh, and so uh, you are consistently in 68 and he is consistently in 78. So if you go online, there will, the, the newest or most up-to-date version of this is online on Blackboard under the information tag. So if you click on information, you will get the, the, the newest version. But I printed this out a couple of weeks ago before we made those changes. Um, so um, I just want to mention quickly the assignments and exams. The tutorial participation is important. And so we're going to, and again, it's nice when you have questions. And I want, you to, I want to hear your questions. As you could see, people had questions and they wait for the break to come and ask rather than asking during the thing. Um, hopefully in tutorial, some of the tutorials are, are only 10 people and others are 20. So hopefully in a smaller group, you'll, be, you'll feel more free to ask questions. But I also want you to write every week, write a question. And then I will look at these and then respond to them. Because I'm sure a lot of you will have the same questions. And so um, I will respond to those in the lectures. Uh, and also the t tutors can respond to them in, in, uh, in the tutorials as well. So the idea is that at the beginning of each tutorial, you hand in a piece of paper that's already typed and printed, so you don't write it in the tutorial. Uh, it's already typed and, and printed. Uh, you hand it in with your name and the week, and then also a question. You only need to do um, 10 of those out of all the 12 weeks of class. The, the main assignment, aside from the exams, the exams are, are really just gonna be text analysis, and the assignment is also text analysis. The only difference between the two is for the test, I give you the, te the, the thing to be analyzed. For the assignment, you get your own text. You, I want you to, to find some natural bit of text uh, and uh, in any genre that has at least 10 clauses with at least some clauses combining together the four co clause complexes. Um, and then you do a full analysis based on in all of the 
the aspects that we're going to be talking about in class. So it's really the same thing and it's only 10 clauses, so it's not very long. So as I mentioned earlier, we're going to be doing the same thing in all aspects. So the, the analysis of self-selected text is actually the same as the exams. The exams is also going to be an analysis of a randy selected text as opposed to a self-selected text. So that's all we're going to be doing is analyzing text because that, that's what it's all about. Um, the required book is this one, um, Michael Halliday's uh, Functional Grammar. It's, I've given it to you online in a Chinese PDF. Uh, uh, it's not illegal, it, it's legal. It's a reprint, uh, they, they legal reprint, uh, or the PDF may be illegal, but I don't know, forget about that. Um, the, uh, but so you can skip the Chinese part or if you, if you read Chinese, it might help you to read the Chinese part as well. Um, there's also another book that I uh, have put on reserve in the library by Jeff Thompson and uh, that I mentioned on, on this. That one is more about the theory than about English. Uh, this one, the reason why I like this book is because it's a brilliant analysis of English structure. It's a grammar of English uh, where he's using it to talk about the theory, but it's really also the most brilliant and insightful gr uh, grammatical analysis of English I've ever found. And so that's why I'm using it. It's not necessarily going to be that easy for you to read, but um, that's why I said it's sometimes in terms of at least the theoretical aspects, you might want to look through Thompson's book, which is much simpler. Um, uh, but if you can get it from, from Halliday's book, Halliday's, this book I have read cover to cover at least 14 times. And each time I read it, I get more out of it. It's one of the best books ever written in linguistics. As I said, Michael, is one, Michael Halliday is one of the best linguists who've ever lived, and this is one of the best books that's ever been written in linguistics. So you will get a lot out of reading this book. And, there, and like I said, the more I read it, every year I read it again, and I get more out of it, because the more you understand, the more you will get from it. Um, and because you become a different person. We, we will talk about this, how you know, meaning creation is subjective. And so as you experience more, you have more of a base in which to create meaning. And so that's why you can read the same thing over and over again and get more meaning out of it because you are a different person each time you read it. Okay, um, back to our lecture. Um, so we call this functional grammar and it's functional in three different senses. Uh, one is that it accounts for how language is used. It's explained in terms of this use or function. So we, we're looking at grammar in the sense of um, why, if you look at, uh, I didn't bring the pictures, but if you look at uh, a hammer, right, there are many kinds of hammers uh, and they're shaped differently, right? So there's a ball peen hammer and there's a claw hammer. You know, there's one that's got like a claw at the end. I should have brought pictures um, of different kinds of hammers. Yeah, I do that sometimes, but uh, this time I didn't. So if you have like a, a sledgehammer or you have, a, there's a kind of special hammer for, for softening meat. Uh, if you buy cheap meat, you, you put MSG on the meat and then you take this hammer which has like lots of spikes on it, you beat the hell out of the meat. Uh, and then it makes the meat softer. Uh, this is what we used to do when we were poor. Uh, and um, then there are hammers for, for many different kinds of things. Now each hammer is shaped differently. And why is it shaped differently? Because it's doing something different. Right? And so language is the same thing. We think that language is the way it is because of what it's doing. We, it is shaped by the function to which we put it. And so since we're doing something, again, it's just like when we're doing anything else. A, a language, as I said, is behavior. And so just like all other behavior that we do, we're trying to do something. So in, 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 in using language, we're trying to communicate. In hammering something, we're trying to you know, hammer in a nail or we're trying to soften meat or we're trying to do whatever. And so what we're trying to do will influence the tools we use to, to, to achieve that. So you know, how I dress, how I eat, you know, if I'm eating Western food, if I eat you know, spaghetti, I come from an Italian background, if I eat spaghetti, I'll use a fork. If I'm eating Chinese noodles, I'll use chopsticks. Um, I don't know why. Uh, you know, they're, they're both noodles, you know, uh, even though they're cooked differently. Uh, so all of these, anyway, the, the idea is that you, there are sets of functions and, and things you're trying to do and you have certain tools for doing them. And so it's the same thing with language, that the language is an evolved set of conventions for a 
for achieving our goals in communication. And so the, 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 the forms that we use are shaped by these functions. So that's the first in, in, in idea. And the, idea, the ideational, reflective, representational, and interpersonal functions reflect the purposes of language. So the ideational thing is understanding the world, the real world. So how do we understand the real world? So when I say this floor is hard, that's an ideational, you know, there's ideational meaning where I'm trying to understand or say something about the world. That, you know, this floor is hard. Um, but then there's, um, so that's our encoding our meanings, the meanings of our experience of the world. So we're trying to, we experience something and then we, we break it down into chunks and then we talk about it um, so we can express. So if I, if I experience something, uh, you know, so I experience the firmness of this thing on the, on the, down here. And so I can think of this as the floor and give it the name, the floor. So then, and then I could give it the quality of firmness. So I can say this floor is hard. Um, so these are all just ways of expressing our experience in the world. And it's different. Every language does that differently. Uh, and even within the same language, you can express things differently. So if you have one event, so like I say, I threw a rock through the window, I can express it by saying, I threw a rock through the window. Or I could say, oh, the rock went through the window. And we don't say who did it. Uh, or we could say, oh, the window broke. Or, or the, you know, the rock just happened to fly through the air and, and broke the window. Or, you know, the window shattered. And, you know, there's many different ways that we can express the same ideational meaning. These are ways that we have experienced in the way we, so we have an experience in the world and then we have different ways of talking about it. And, um, and then, so that's understanding the environment. And then we also have this meanings of interaction, attitude, relationships. Those are the interpersonal meanings. Uh, you know, what's going on when I'm talking to you? I'm, because language, like I said, is behavior, but it's, it's a special kind of behavior. It's interactional behavior. We're always interacting with somebody. We don't just, well, sometimes we talk to ourselves and I sing to ourselves or whatever. But most of the time we, well, even when we do that, you know, did, did I leave my keys in the car? You're, you're still talking to yourself. I mean, we say it that way. But normally when we're interacting, we're interacting with somebody else other than ourselves. And so this is a, a part of all, um, all in, uh, communication is, is interaction. And so that's this expressing attitudes and relationships. And then the textual matter fun function organizes these two, the experiential and interpersonal meanings into a linear uh, structure um, and encodes the meanings of the text development. So that when we, when we are talking, uh, uh, we, part of the textual thing is, is a building up, right? Because you can't just say something and then people will understand it. People can't understand something totally out of the blue. You have to always relate one thing to another. This is why we don't teach three-year-olds nuclear physics because they don't have anything, no way to incorporate the information you're telling them. So that's why education has to be gradual. You have to constantly build up the base in which people can make sense of things. And so the, it's the same thing with a sentence. When you, when you say a sentence, you, you don't just say something completely new. You usually start with something that the person can relate to and then build on that. Uh, and the same thing with a larger text. We'll talk about next week how this principle actually goes throughout the, the whole structure of even a whole book. Um, also, each part of each structure within the grammar is explained by reference to its function in the entire system because the structures are uh, configurations of functions. So the, the whole, as I mentioned earlier, you know, theme only makes sense in relation to ream or topic only makes sense in relation to comment and comment only makes sense in relation to topic. And so it's the, the, these two functions working together in a single functional structure that gives it the, the meaning. Um, so we can talk about these functional metastructures or the meta metafunctional structures or functional structures or whatever you want to call them as types of meaning. They're all, you know, we call it the interpersonal meaning or the textual meaning or the uh, ideational meaning. And they are expressed uh, simultaneously. So if you say Peter plays tennis, you're simultaneously representing something, you know, Peter is playing of tennis. Uh, you're interacting with somebody, you're, you're making a statement to them, you're telling them, you're giving them some information. Um, and you're also organizing the linear flow of the text by putting Peter as your first element and then the other elements following it. 
But you can change the utterance uh, by changing the interpersonal aspects. So instead of making a statement, Peter plays tennis, I can ask for information and say, does Peter play tennis? So there I've changed the nature of the interaction between you and me. Um, or I can say, I can change the representational, the way I represent it. So it's the same reality, but I can say instead of he plays tennis, I say he enjoys tennis. So there I've changed how I'm expressing the experiential aspect of it. Or I can change the textual aspect, textual aspect in terms of what I make the, the theme. So I can put tennis first and say tennis is what Peter plays. So I've used a different structure making tennis the theme rather than Peter the theme. So these are ways that we can manipulate these types of meaning. And each one of these means something different, even though it may be expressing some real world reality, the same real world reality. When we say it differently, we create a different, we get the person to create different meanings in their minds. Um, and this will, part of this is, as I, I was saying, is part of the whole development of a, of a text. When we're talking to somebody, it's not that each sentence stands by itself. It relates to everything that came before and also to what comes after. So there's this flow in text, and we'll be looking at that, how this flow of what we're talking about. And so part of what determines uh, the, the, the order of things is the kind of flow that you want to get. I saw Michael Halliday one time give a beautiful lecture where he speaks actually very fluent Chinese, um, beautiful Chinese. Uh, and I saw him give a lecture where he compared the last couple of um, paragraphs of Darwin's The Origin of Species, which is a beautifully written book. And the last two, uh, the, the, the flow of the text is so gorgeous, so beautiful. And it flows all the way to this, the last word is evolves, you know, and, it, and so the whole book is about evolution. And, it, and it, so the whole text kind of flows towards this last word, which is evolved. And then he compared that with the Chinese translation of the same text. And he showed how the Chinese translation did not, the person who translated did not have any sense of this flow and did not try to imitate that flow. And so the text felt very disjointed and didn't have that same sense of leading to a particular way of thinking, uh, which, the, which the English text has. So, you know, this is one aspect that, that this theory, that no other theory talks about that. This is a theory that, that does talk about that sort of thing. And that's why people have found it so useful. Um, now, a text is a grammatical unit, a semantic unit. I mean, it's also a grammatical unit, but it's a semantic unit. So the explanation has to be functional and semantic. So when we talk about text, and, and when Michael talks, of, or Professor Halliday, whatever, uh, when he talks about um, wording in the book, what he really means is the cognitive categories of the people and their way of thinking. It's not really about the words. It's kind of confusing the way he writes it, uh, but because he talks about wording and he talks about words. The words you put together in a certain way, but they reflect, they are representations of the wording, what he calls the wording, which is our semantic categories. Now, every language is unique in terms of their semantic categories. Uh, you know, the way we construe the world, the way we understand the world. Each language, even each person individually, because our understandings are subjective, they are unique to us. So the way you understand a concept like dog is based on how you first experience dogs, right? So for some people, when you think of dog, what is the prototype you think of dog? If the first dog you saw was German Shepherd, then you might take that as your, uh, your prototype. Or if the, the only dogs you ever knew were um, Pekingese or, or what's that little one that looks like a rat? Um, Chihuahuas. Chihuahuas, yeah. Uh, if that was your only, uh, your only experience of dogs, then you, you might take that as your prototype. And then that would, that would really influence the way you understood the whole category because the way our minds categories work is we have a prototype and then things belong or not belong to those categories dependent on their, how close they fit the prototype. So this is what we call fuzzy categories or, or prototype categories. And that's the way people think and that's the way language is reflected. So those of you who know Chinese, if you think of the word tang in Chinese or tong if you're Cantonese, um, and you think of, the, what, what do you think of when you hear that word? And then you think of the word soup in English. If you're a native speaker of English and you hear the word soup, it's nothing like tang in Chinese. Um, tang in Chinese is what Americans would think of when they hear the word broth. 
Um, and what you think, of, what we would, what we think of when we when we say the word soup is what you think of as gung, uh, which is a very thick kind of thing that you can eat with a spoon, uh, and it's not drink. It's not a drink. For Chinese, um, uh, soup is a something you drink. You know, uh, and it's very different from in the West. You you eat soup with a spoon, or you dump bread in it. Um, actually, that's the best way to eat soup is to dump bread. In. Uh, that's the only reason I eat soup, is because of the bread. Um, so I don't eat Chinese soup, it's just not my thing. Uh, it's, it's just broth, you know. Uh, uh, so it's very different conceptions, and that's true of every word in the language. So when you say a word table and you say draws in Chinese, or, or like, um, just to go back to soup, there's a, in, in Tagalog, the word sabao is, is, would be translated as soup, but it actually has very different things. So if you buy for example, you know, the, the Filipinos like to eat this uh, duck egg or chicken egg where the chicken is already formed in the egg, the balut, it's called balut in Tagalog. And so they eat this uh, as a kind of uh, pulutan, um, like what you, when, you, when you drink the liquor, you eat this as it's very restorative, or if you give blood, you, you eat this, or sometimes they just at night, they eat it for fun. But when you open the egg, there's some liquid that comes out, and they also call that the sabao. Um, and also, if you have a, 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 um, a like a fried vegetable, say, for example, and it's kind of has some sauce there, some what you call in Chinese or sauce in English, they also call that sabao. So each language has a totally different category in terms of what is the prototype of that category, but also what is the, what we call the extension of the category, the, the kind of things you can use to refer uh, use that word to refer to. And that's true of every word in the language, that it's, it's not 100% overlap. So translation is kind of a myth that we can translate from one language to another. It's, you try to reinterpret it in a way that makes sense to the speakers, but it's not really, there's no one-to-one -one translation. And so that's why even a word like harmony, you know, the Chinese talk about huixie all the time, and they, in the West they translate that as harmony. It really means something very different from, uh, from harmony in English. Harmony in English means we're not killing each other, so we're living in harmony. That's harmony. <clears throat> That's all that's really required for harmony, is we don't have to be doing anything together. As long as we're not killing each other, we're living in harmony. In China, to be living in harmony means you're doing what the party tells you to do, the Communist Party tells you to do. And if, if you don't do what the party tells you to do, then you will be harmonized. Uh, I'm, I'm serious. You say it's fei <coughs> xie in Chinese. You get harmonized. So if you like set up a website and you say something the Communist Party doesn't like, then you, you, your website gets shut down and that's called being harmonized. Um, <coughs> so how did I get over there? I don't know. Sometimes I go off on tangents. But, oh, I was talking about, oh yeah, the semantic unit and wordings. So these categories are, um, are you know, how we think. And those categories are what's reflected in our language because we give names, we give labels to those categories, so like table or soup or whatever. So those are simply labels, that's the words that reflect what those categories. And so it's the categories that are really important. And when you learn another language, what's important is not learning the, the labels, but learning the, word, the categories themselves. So like when you, when you learn English, for example, uh, or if you say you're an English speaker and you're learning Chinese, you have to learn that say, have in English does not mean the same thing as yo in Chinese. Yo in Chinese actually involves, uh, is, is only part of the meaning of have. So you actually have to change your, your way of thinking, your categories in your brain in order to use Chinese properly. Because like, like say this is mine, and this tail is um, say this is my clicker, my pointer, whatever you want to call this. So yeah, I don't have a category for this. Um, so say this is mine, and I put it in her hand. In English, I can say she has my pointer. In Chinese, I can't say tayo with the pointer. Uh, <laughs> um, I have to say what well, the pointer is at hanar. Uh, my pointer is at her or with her. Uh, I have to use a locational expression, um, and. I mean, I, I realized this one day when I was, saying, I was talking to my wife, and I said many years ago, and I said, are my keys with you? And I went, why did I say that? Because in English, we don't say that, are my keys with you? We say, do you have my keys? And then I realized, oh, the Chinese has infected my brain. 
and so, so I was thinking in Chinese categories rather than English categories. But this is what you have to do in order to, of course, you don't want to mess them up, you know, and it's, you want to keep them separate. And I, this is one thing I worry about speaking different languages and I'm starting to lose the boundaries and becoming this, this uh, amorphous kind of thing, I don't know. Uh, so you have to try to keep them separate as, and, uh, uh, and realize that you're, you're thinking different. You actually perceive the world differently when you speak a different language. So like in, um, in uh, Tagalog, for example, when you speak Tagalog, you have to make a, a distinction between ba and pa. There is actually two different grammatical particles. Ba means question. Uh, so if I say Hindi ba, then it means not. You know, Hindi means no, and then ba means a question. But if I say Hindi pa, that means it's still not yet, right? So pa and ba are very different. Now in English, they sound exactly the same. And in Chinese, they sound very much the same. So when I speak English, I don't distinguish those two. Um, but I have to distinguish between pa and ba and pa on one side and pa on the other side. Whereas in Tagalog, pa and pa are the same sound. Even pa, pa, and fa are the same sound. So if you say fa, you say pa, you say pa, that's all the same to a Tagalog speaker, a you know, Filipino. They will hear that as the same exact sound. Um, and, uh, but then, so when I speak Tagalog, I don't distinguish between those two, but I have to distinguish between ba and pa. And so when I speak English, then I have to distinguish between ba and pa, but I don't have to distinguish between ba and ba, ba and ba. So, um, it, it, I'm getting baba. Um, and so it's, it's actually difficult to, to get to that point. That's what, one of the reasons why it's so hard to learn foreign languages. If you, because it's a habit, um, you have to work on overcoming your, your original habits of perceiving things in a particular way. Uh, and then so you have to learn to perceive the world differently. In other words, cut up the world in different ways because the categories are different. Um, so um, the, the categories are explained as realizations of semantic patterns. The grammatical categories are explained as realizations of semantic patterns. Um, these, it grows out of, these things come out of our, when I say emergent grammar is we, we, we don't see grammar as just a thing. It doesn't exist anywhere. It's, it's our conventions for communicating. So it's emergent, it's constantly coming into being as we interact. It's not a fixed system. It's something that's it's very much um, a byproduct of our interaction. So it's emergent. And so the relation between the meaning and the form is not arbitrary. Both kinds of grammatical, the, the general kinds of grammatical pattern, the specific manifestations bear a natural relation to the meanings that you're trying to express. So these, the, the, you know, there's these categories that we create in our minds and we give them names and then we use those in representing our cognitive categories. Um, and so the functional grammar interprets the form by reference to that meaning. So, we, you know, we're trying to understand, we're trying to get to that, that underlying meaning. We're not just interested in the form by itself. We're not, it's not just, the form itself is not interesting. It's how is the form representing a particular meaning? Why, why is it used the way it's used? Um, now, the, the grammar that, or the system of analysis I'm gonna be talking about is different from some other types of structures, uh, other ways of analyzing structure, because this is what we call a paradigmatic grammar. So it's seen that as a choice, uh, par paradigm means you have like a certain choice, uh, rather than a syntagmatic grammar would be things lined up in a row. So in a, in a choice grammar, the idea is that when you are going to express yourself, you have choices. And at each point you make a choice. So say for example, um, if we take just mood, uh, we have the choices of declarative, imperative, and interrogative. So if I want to say something, I have one of the first choices I have is do I choose an interrogative form or do I choose an, a declarative form or do I choose an imperative form? And depending on the situation, I will choose one of those, whatever is most useful. Now, the, the forms actually developed because of the use that they think. So interrogatives developed for asking questions, statements developed for making statements, imperatives developed for 
um, uh, giving orders. But it doesn't mean that we always have to use one for the other. So sometimes now, for example, to be polite, I want, to, I want you to do something, I can say, sit down. Or, so that would be using an imperative, I can make that choice. Or I could choose a different one, I could choose an uh, interrogative. I could say, could you sit down? Or will you sit down? Or some other variety of that, I can use an interrogative. Um, or I could use a statement, I could say, sitting down would be great. Um, or, you know, as an order, like I say, cap captains, uh, enlisted men must always wear their uniform. Right, so you're making just a statement, but that can be taken as an order, right? So at each point, we, we need to decide which, you know, which way we go. But then once you make that one choice, once you've entered the system and you've made one choice, that will lead to more choices. And then so as you go along, you're making choices. So the text is, can be analyzed from the point of view of the, the, the choices that are made at each point in the text, the development. The, test, the text itself is seen as a process. It's not a thing. It's the person trying to communicate and they're, they're doing it in a, in a, you know, start to end, there's a process going on, a process of making these choices. And this is where the evaluative component comes in because you can evaluate the choices that the speaker makes or the writer or whatever it is. Uh, you know, you can make, the, you could say, okay, at this point, the person chose this one instead of this one. Now, so this one would have led, led to one particular meaning, this one led to a different particular meaning, so you can see whether that was a good choice or not. How would it have worked out if they'd made another choice? So this is where the evol evaluative component comes in, which other theories don't have, because they're not based on this paradigmatic sense. Um, now, the other aspect that that is really important to this theory. It was developed by Michael Halliday based on his, his teacher was named uh, Firth, J.R. Firth. And Firth was, in, was in, uh, uh, influenced by another scholar named Malinowski, um, who had very much influence in social science generally, but um, had this idea that you, you can't understand anything divorced from the context of situation and the context of culture. So, the way we understand things is by reference to assumptions or uh, things we know from either the immediate situation that we're in or from our more general context of culture. So how do you know how to use your linguistic forms is actually part of your culture. And it is just culture, right? It's not some thing. It, that's why it's, it, you know, the conven we call them conventions. It's just like our conventions for dressing or our conventions for eating. It's something you learn as you're growing up based on your experiences. And so um, the, uh, in order to uh, be able to understand what somebody is saying in a particular context, you have to take into account this particular situation of the interaction, because it is, again, going back to the interaction. So you take into account the context of situation, and then you take into account the overall context of culture. So when you are, when you hear somebody say something, um, then you have to understand aspects of the culture. So say, for example, um, um, uh, one time uh, when I was living in China, uh, somebody asked me for a pen. They were going to write a letter to somebody. In the old days, people actually wrote letters. Um, so in the old days, they were writing a letter with a pen, and I said, oh, sorry, I only have a red pen. Now, why would that make sense? I don't know if you've lost that part of Chinese culture and you've learned it. But in Chinese culture, you only write, or you only use a red pen to write to somebody when you're going to dump them. You know, in other words, if they're your lover, you use a red pen to dump them. Uh, and so, if they're writing a letter to somebody they don't want to dump, then they can't use a red pen. Uh, I actually made that mistake once, and that's why I remember it very well. Uh, I wrote to a girl, and she said, "What?" Um, uh, anyway. Uh, so, you know, as part of the context of culture is to know these kind of things. Um, I could give you lots and lots of examples, but just think about when you're listening to people, how much cultural knowledge and, and situational knowledge you bring into understanding everything that, that, that you do understand. So there's these, con they, they look at it in this theory in terms of concentric, uh, concentric circles where the context of culture is the outer one, and then there's a context of situation, and then the text is within both of those. So um, you, can, you can look at it as levels, like this, context of culture is the highest level, context of situation, 
And then these things are realized in the discourse semantics, the systems of meaning, which is realized in the, we use the term lexical grammar because we don't distinguish words from grammar. It's all just one thing, the language. And then these are realized in the systems of sounds or the writing or the gestures. And so we can see it as concentric circles where you've got your expression. This is the actual sounds you hear. And this is an ex a representation of this, the wordings, this kind of lexical grammar and the meanings that they represent. And then this is all part of the context of situation, which is then part of the context of culture. So it, all of this is relevant to understanding to the creation of meaning when we want to understand the creation of meaning. So in one context, if you say the word table, it will mean one thing. If you do it in a different context, then it may mean something else. Um, not just between languages, but even within, this, in, within the same language when you, when you use the same expression, depending on what cultural assumptions or what situational assumptions, it can have a very different meaning. Um, what did I skip? Uh, and the culture is manifested through its situation. So by paying attention to the text and situation, the child, that's how the child learns the code. What he means by the code is these semantic categories that you actually learn it from um, your actual experience in these situations. You actually, that's how you, you learn your culture, your way of thinking. Um, and the using the code to interpret the text, he deduces the, the culture. So that's how a child, the child isn't really taught uh, a lot of stuff. He just experiences it and then uses inference to figure out what the relationships are and what the categories are. Um, although they may be very different. Uh, a lot of times when you talk to kids, they, they can't understand what you're saying. I remember when I was a little kid, my mother used to say to me, whenever I got in trouble, she said, oh, it's gonna go on your record. Now, up to that point, the only records I knew were these, you know, wax, not wax, they were plastic music uh, records. I don't know if you've ever seen them, but in the old days, we used to listen to these discs and we put it, there was a machine there, you put the, the stylus on there and it would spin around and play music. Um, and uh, so that was the only record I knew. And I thought, how could they write on that? You know, I mean, I, I had no way of understanding that. And it wasn't until much later that I was able to relate to what you, to understand what she was saying, because my experience of the culture was not yet full enough for me to understand what she was talking about. But you infer it later on, you, you get it from that. Um, okay, we have about 15 minutes left. So this is the basic background. And now I'm going to talk more about um, applying these different approaches to analyze, actually doing analysis of text, breaking down the text into constituents. And the first constituent we want to talk about is clauses. So I'm going to talk about how to identify clauses within a complex um, clause complex, what we call clause complex or a complex sentence. But this, is there someone have questions? Are there some questions before we move on? Hopefully you will all understand this. Uh, and uh, again, the readings will help, uh, the practice will help, the tutorials, you're gonna go and do some practice of this. Um, what are we talking about? Breaking things down um, uh, and uh, yeah, looking at it from different perspectives uh, when you get to tutorial. So uh, we'll see. So the, um, when we identify clauses, uh, we want to break it down and there's three ways using the three meta functions. We can break it down uh, in using these three different ways. So if we use the ideational meta function, then what we can do is look at who's doing what to whom. And the core of that is what's being done, right? So you can, you can start to look for what we call verbs, you know, the, the, the action bits uh, and, and see. So if you look at the you look for the process, what we call processes. The verb is actually the, the grammatical label, but process, we use the term process because it's more of a semantic label. Um, it's kind of what's happening, either you know, the doing or the, the happening or the being. That's what we call process in this theory. So we're looking for the processes. The processes name events taking place like go or cook or think or sleep or they relate things like, to, like is, like this is hard, or this is a book, or seems, this seems hard, um, or has, and so on. 
and then you can divide up into the processes and whatever goes with them. So, you know, we think of who does what to whom. So if you've isolated the, the, the what you're doing, then you can kind of see who's doing it and who's it being done to. Uh, so that's the who, what, where, and when, and why. <coughs> so if you have some idea what a verb is, then you can start looking for process in terms of the verbs. So let's look at uh, this one text. So this is an actual text. There are fewer species of the baleen, the larger baleen whales that filter krill and small fish through their baleen plates. The largest is the blue whale, which is seen frequently in the Gulf of St. Lawrence. It reaches a length of 100 feet and a weight of 200 tons. The young are 25 feet long at birth and gain about 200 pounds a day on their milk diet. So I put in bold all of the different processes those things that are kind of the core bits of what's happening, right? The, the, the doings and the happenings um, and the relations. So the R here is just showing the relationship between these things and then the filter is what they're doing. Again, relation here, relation, and then um, this is uh, reaching a length. You could talk about it as a doing, but it's really more of a relational thing here. That just means they are up to, to 100 feet. Um, and so this one is largely relational but we can still break the text down and into these bits. So we can say, okay, we take this as the core and then the things that go along with it. Uh, so in this one, you filter krill. Um, so the, the krill or the thing that gets filtered and the small fish as well, using the blading plates. So these kind of go together. So we can say here that there are fewer species of the baleen whales, that's one chunk, that filter krill and small fish through the baleen plates, that's another chunk right, built around these processes. The largest is the blue whale, another chunk, which is seen frequently in the Gulf of St. Lawrence. Uh, and each of these is a chunk that we can isolate by identifying the process and seeing kind of what goes together with that bit. Now, of course, there's also the clue of the intonation, the, you know, the, the, if you were to read this out loud, each of these would be one intonation unit, you know, one breath, basically. And also we have punctuation, which kind of is a big clue. Uh, so you can use those. Um, so that's one way of doing it. Another way is looking at the interpersonal metafunction. Now, so the interpersonal metafunction is all about uh, communication as interaction and dialogue. And so you can break these things down into dividing the text into propositions you can argue with, right? So. Um, if we have the same text and then we you know, say there are a few species of the larger bathing whales. So this is a statement. And then you can ask, well, are there? You can question that statement. So you can, you can do that. That filter uh, krill and small fish through their plates. You can argue with that. You could say, that's another statement. You could say, no, they don't, right? So there's a, it's, a, it's a chunk of the interaction that you can identify. So it's a statement or it's a question or it's a whatever. And so you can argue with it. It's what we call a proposition. A proposition is like one chunk of meaning that you can argue with. And so uh, the largest is the blue whale. Again, you can question that. Is it? Is it the largest? You know, uh, which is frequently seen in the, in the St. Lawrence. No, it isn't. You can argue with that. Uh, it reaches a length of 200 tons. Does it? So each of these is, you know, interacting with the statement at, in some way, either denying it or questioning it or, or affirming it, um, any one of those. So then you can break that down and again, identify the units that you can, you can argue with or you can um, engage with. We can think of this because it's the interpersonal matter function, you can think of engaging with it. So it, it just so happens that we end up with the same breakdown that we had with the other one. So, but this is a different, an independent way of looking at it. Now, the third one is to use the textual meta function. Now, what this one is doesn't rely on full statements. Uh, it doesn't have to have a verb in it and whatnot. So it has a certain benefit to it um, because certain texts will have uh, the same starting points and we can look for those starting points because Remember I talked about the textual meta function is to a large extent about theme and ream. So the theme is kind of the topic. It's actually not really just topic, it's the speaker's starting point. It's kind of like a signpost where it's like the teacher, the speaker saying, okay, this is where I'm starting. This is where you start your interpretation. And I'll talk more next week about why that's important. But 
Um, but basically, in, in many texts, you will have a very clear progression of those starting points. Uh, like this one, for 1,000 years, whales have been commercial interests for meat, oil, meal, and whalebone. About 1,000 AD, whaling started with the Basques using sailing vessels and rowboats. Over the next few centuries, whaling shifted to humpbacks, greys, sperms, and bowheads. By 1500, they were whaling off Greenland. By the 1700s, off Atlantic America. By the 1800s, in the <laughs> South Pacific, Antarctica, and Bering Sea. Early in this century, whaling shifted to the larger and faster baleen whales. So you can see these bits that I highlighted, uh, made in bold. They follow a temporal progression. So each of the starting point of each of these chunks is a different time period. And this is one way to organize the text. As I said, you know, the textual metafunction is a way of organizing the flow from what came before to what came after. So here we have a very clear flow, temporal flow, uh, in, in what I'm talking about. I mean, I could have said, well, now we do this, but in the past we did that, and then in the middle we did this, and you, know, you could do it in a different order. But people have a much easier time understanding it if you start with the earlier, older stuff and you move towards the newer stuff. So you get this clear temporal progression. And here marked very clearly 1,000 years uh, this and, and then this is the top, more like a topic, and then you have your temporal markings along the way. Um, now, the good thing about this one is that the, they organize this temporal expression, they organize the text into these units, and this one is different from the others because it doesn't give you exactly the same results as the other types, because if you'll notice here, um, by the 1700s off Atlantic America, by the 1800s in the South Pacific, Antarctic, and Bering Sea. So they don't have verbs and they're not full statements, um, but they make sense within the overall context of the development of the text. And so using this thing, it, this won't work with all texts, but in this case, um, dividing it into clauses um, will, uh, will only work with those that have a consistent pattern of starting points but it can be useful when the text leaves out the processes, as in this one, these examples I just read, where the processes are not mentioned. Um, it gives us a way to understand the chunking, you know, the, uh, the flow of the text and how these, how these have their meaning. Um, okay, and that's all we got for today. Um, hmm? Did you have a question? Oh. Um, so, any, are, are there some questions, I should say, I shouldn't say are there any questions, are there some questions before we break? Otherwise, we're done for today, and they'll see you all, did you guys stand up, stand up and say hello, hello. So, this is Luke, this is Amanda, and you're going to, some of you have toed right away, so you can just follow them over to the south spine. Um, some of you will see them later. Okay, thanks for coming. Would have been lonely without you. See ya. Successes, right? Did it only apply to the present tense?